Uh, first of all, we'd like to start the webinar today. I'd just like to invite the HOD of the Department of Complementary Medicine, Dr. Radmila Razlock, uh, just to welcome everybody and just to introduce the University of Johannesburg. Over to you, Dr. Razlock. All right, thanks. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, a very, very warm welcome um, from the Department of Complementary Medicine, the Faculty of Health Sciences, and on behalf of our Executive Dean, Professor Khan, and the Greater University of Johannesburg, thank you for joining us for today's online public lecture, uh, which is entitled The Road to NHI Lessons from COVID-19, uh, presented by Dr. Nicholas Crisp. Um, Nicholas, thank you so much for sharing your expert knowledge and experiences with us today, and we look forward to a really exciting presentation. Um, Neil, thank you once again in uh, per traditional Neil fashion for arranging um, the superb meeting today and for coordinating today's events. Um, could I kindly ask you to introduce Nicholas to our attendees today um, before he gets on the road. Thanks so much. Thanks so much Dr. Razlog. So uh, our guest today is Dr. Nicholas Crisp. Um, as you all would have seen from his profile. Uh, he's got a lot of information, a lot of background to him that has positioned him in the place that he finds himself at the moment as uh, a lead, both a consultant and worker. We mustn't forget how hard it is that people work in all of this in order to uh, look at the implementation of the National Health Insurance Fund. Uh, it did mention in his profile that he's had a, a lot of experience across Africa, but some of those countries where it is that he worked before really has included South Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, Lesotho, Botswana, Namibia, and Tanzania. Um, and he has previously served as special advisors and played an important role in the critical function and establishment of a number of other organizations as well. Uh, the format essentially for the presentation is we'd be looking to have a presentation that goes up to about 60 minutes. Uh, Dr. Crisp um, has indicated that he's going to try and get through the presentation fairly quickly so you can spend as much time as possible on questions and answers. So please, it is an opportunity for everyone if you have any questions related to NHI, the NHI fund and its further development, please to uh, write them down in the Q&A section and we can take those at the end of the presentation. Um, so a warm welcome to Dr. Crisp. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'll now hand over to you and you can start your presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Dr. Rosslock, for the invitation and for allowing me to share some thoughts. I'm going to just uh, struggle a bit here with the technology first. Stop the screen sharing. Yes. And get my screen up so that you can follow the presentation. Right. I hope that's visible to everybody. So let's let's go ahead. So once again, thanks very much. As Neil said, I'm going to try and go through quickly because you don't want to just hear what I want to tell you. You've got questions on your mind and it would be far better if I'm able to answer those questions. It's usually that many people have the same questions. So let's start off by looking at some of the things that we saw during COVID-19 and the impact of uh, COVID-19 on the public health sector in particular, but also obviously on the whole health sector. I'm going to start off just talking to a few uh, high-level observations, uh, to, you know, just to give you a sense of what we saw happening around us um, during the initial and now more recently the development of the, the COVID epidemic. So the first one was on service delivery issues. One of the most striking things was how poorly prepared the health services generally were for infection prevention and control. Across the board, public and private sector, we saw outbreaks in hospitals, in ICUs, and amongst staff, we've had a, a huge number of uh, personnel who've been infected, many of whom did get infected in the workplace, not all, of course, many do get infected at home, but. Uh, across the board, infection prevention and control was really left to an individual in the hospital and not, it was not taken on board as everybody's responsibility. And that's the first lesson we have to learn. Every single person in the health system needs to take responsibility. The second service delivery issue is really only going to strike us 
<coughs> down the line. And that is that non-COVID care came to a standstill. The private sector, GPs and specialists lost up to 80% of their income, depending on their practices. Hospitals were closed in the beginning. People were fearful of traveling, even when they had quite serious conditions. And of course, for anything not so serious, and including follow-ups, people were um, stuck at home during the lockdown and didn't go for the baby care, for uh, immunizations, for antenatal care, and so forth. So uh, we have a big concern that the non-COVID care, uh, which has been poorly, poorly provided during this period, is going to come back. And, and uh, I saw a report this morning saying 25 years of hard work on immunization was lost in 25 weeks because of uh, lack of immunization globally during this period. So that's something we are going to need to concentrate on heavily now. As far as infrastructure is concerned, uh, we already knew going into COVID that a lot of the public sector infrastructure was depleted, old, um, needed to be refurbished or replaced. And many places the buildings were, um, there, there were building construction programs underway and various levels of completion. One of the good things that happened was that there was acceleration of improvement of much of the infrastructure. So while we saw the public profile in the media showing us all the field hospitals and the, you know, the quite impressive um, infrastructure that was built outside of hospitals, in fact, what was going on was a huge amount of repurposing and improvement of infrastructure in public hospitals. And some private hospitals also had realignments of their, of their buildings and repurposing the buildings. So that we are left with as, a, as an improvement after COVID. You will have heard quite a lot about equipment during, from the media, especially ventilators, but there was a lot of equipment that was purchased, which uh, was not in place prior to COVID. And obviously that equipment's gonna remain. And even the equipping of the field hospitals, such as the big one at CTICC and the, the, the Johannesburg one in the stadium, uh, that equipment, those beds, the sheets, the blankets, the pillows, etc., everything that was purchased for those facilities obviously remains now in the public health system and is now available for, um, for continued care uh, going forward. So it was not all wasted. There was some infrastructure that was custom built or purpose built for single off purposes uh, that will be lost but the vast majority of it is, is positive. The third uh, infrastructure issue is we all came to understand how oxygen works. Right from bulk, from, from producing the oxygen, or what they call is extracting the oxygen, because obviously we don't manufacture oxygen, we extract it from the air, and how that, who the extractors are, who the suppliers are, how that supply works, the bulk tanks, because obviously now COVID, we needed not the normal type of oxygen supply, which would have been anything from two to six liters per minute. We were now working up to 30, and in some cases, even more than 30 liters per minute, and not one or two or five patients at a time, but hundreds of patients across the hospitals at a time. So the oxygen supply system in the country has been much better understood. For those of us who are not familiar, there are only two oxygen suppliers in the country in the medical supply uh, of oxygen. And then there are two others, those two plus another two others who work on industrial oxygen supply. And industrial oxygen, we in South Africa produce more, or just slightly more than we do medical oxygen. And fortunately it's of a good quality and we've been able to use that. So what happened during COVID is that hospitals that did not have bulk supply tanks got those bulk supply tanks. Hospitals who are, were smaller and uh, uh, more remote and you couldn't get oxygen bulk supply to them, then the, the cylinders were rescheduled or repurposed. And for instance, in the Eastern Cape, more than 1,000 additional of these massive oxygen cylinders were distributed. The bulk supply tankers were, imp uh, process was improved. And then of course the piping. Many of the old hospitals have got very small pipes. And as I said, if you only have to cater for very low oxygen flow, you don't need the kind of piping that you need for COVID management. 
So we are left with oxygen supply infrastructure and oxygen uh, administration infrastructure vastly superior to what we had prior to COVID. As far as staffing is concerned, there's been some gain in the number of staff filling up posts, but the most important thing in staffing was a deficiency, and that was in our occupational health and safety. Across the board, uh, in all provinces, there were quite serious deficiencies in occupational health and safety, and I'm sure you're all familiar from the media, labor unions have been up in arms about this because of the, um, the bad management in many facilities. Uh, of uh, PPE in particular, but it relates to the infection prevention control as well. So huge effort has been put into improving occupational health and safety. That's not to say it's, it's uh, optimal yet, but it has certainly brought this to the fore of, uh, of our minds and uh, there have been great improvements in most hospitals. As far as health products are concerned, we need to be grateful that we did not run out of medicine anywhere. None of the key medicines were depleted during this time. Part of it might be because non-COVID care was uh, reduced, as I mentioned in the first point, but partly because there's been big efforts in the last couple of years to improve medicine supply. And that goes from the bulk supply through the producers, importers, through the entire supply chain and into the hospitals. PPE, as we know, has been a major, major challenge. Besides the corruption and the issues that have been in the media, we've also had some quite serious challenges with getting with competing in the international space for PPE, and that has resulted in some good and bad things. Some of the bad things have been the quality of some of the PPE that's been brought in has not been appropriate, and part of it has been good things that we've increased PPE production in South Africa, and companies were able to switch their lines to do that. As far as consumables are concerned, we again did not run out of consumables, which is quite remarkable. Even the oxygen supply and the masks uh, for oxygen admi administration to patients have generally been quite well provided for. So that is one part of our system that has held up pretty well and we've learned a lot about how to improve going forward. Two other areas that uh, have had major lessons learned. The one is in digital data management. So when COVID arrived, um, there, was, there were already three or four years of work in the national health insurance systems, um, getting data, getting the big data architecture sorted out, but nothing like the integration and competence that was required to manage the volume of data and the, and the detail of data that we needed to manage COVID, the COVID pandemic in the country. And it has been a remarkable, gearing up of um, many projects that were only scheduled to take place into the future to get improve data quality and data completeness. Uh, we still don't have connectivity to all the hospitals in the country and certainly not to all the clinics, but the, the, the sharing of data, specifically in the public sector, but towards the end now, also with the private sector, has improved dramatically. You will know from the early days of the complaints that um, people were saying we don't, we're not uh, publishing all the information about cases. Well, we were publishing everything we knew about, but getting the completeness of the data was the challenge. And now that that data system is operating smoothly through the NICD with complete data, it's uh, vastly improved. I mean, you would find it quite strange that up to, in certain parts of the country, up to a third of all laboratory tests taken the person who took the specimen, public and private sector, did not record an ID number nor an address of the person that they took the specimen from. You wonder how they thought they were going to contact that patient again. Um, and then this, the other part of digi digital data management that has improved is analytics. And this has only been more recent, um, where we've been able to automate some of the analytics for decision taking. It's not all, anal all, all automated, obviously, and there's lots of work to do going forward. And I'm going to talk more just now about the NHI, and you'll see why this analytics is so important. But we are able to take decisions far quicker now because the digital data is more complete and some of the analysis is taking place uh, automatically. As far as governance is concerned, 
Certainly in the public sector, we've learned a tremendous amount. In the initial periods, I'm sure you're all aware, our provinces get their own budgets for health. There isn't a national health. There isn't a budget for the country for health. We have nine provincial budgets, and the provinces allocate um, budgets to their various competencies so that our health budget that we report on is in fact 10 budgets, one for the national department and nine for the provinces. So in the beginning, each of the provinces knew that they had to act and had to act fast. And sometimes the coordination was pretty poor and uh, not maliciously, but because people were just trying their best to, to intervene. That improved dramatically. And now at this point of the epidemic, when we're over the peak, it's actually running pretty smoothly that there's good communication between all the provinces and the national department. In the beginning, you're also aware from the media that policy directives were disjointed, there weren't clinical guidelines, the ministerial advisory committee was in its infancy, there wasn't a lot of information other than from the global space, from other countries, so we didn't really know what to expect in South Africa. We were all very concerned about not knowing what the impact of our large HIV positive population would do to our COVID and so forth. So it took a while to get a process in place for national policy directives and clinical guidelines. But once again, that is running much more smoothly now and uh, the communication has improved. And then of course the big failure, which has uh, upset us all tremendously, is the corruption that took place. This was across the board, not just the health sector, but uh, the lesson is if you put a lot of money into a space without very, very tight controls and you need to spend that money quickly, um, all, kind, all manner of things go wrong. And um, besides dealing with that corruption and taking uh, action against the people who were responsible, we need to make sure that we block those holes going forward. And I'll talk a little bit about that in what we're already starting to do for NHI. So just one last comment before we move off this slide is that we have a huge private sector in the country. And one of the other lessons, which I haven't put down here as a specific point, I'm going to talk about it now in the NHI context. One of the other things that we learned is that, in fact, we are able to work together. And it was a bit difficult in the beginning. Each one was looking inward rather than outward. It was difficult to know at what point the public sector would be saturated and need the resources of the private sector. And the private sector, the public sector didn't understand that the private sector had been so devastated and depleted um, when COVID hit. So we were operating in our own little compartments in the beginning. That has improved dramatically. And as I say, we have discovered it's actually not that difficult to sit around the table and thrash through differences of opinion on matters. So I want to now focus on the future for a bit, well, for the rest of the, my presentation. And so I want to start off with the high level questions because I'm constantly concerned that in the public space, people ask questions that show that we are not communicating properly about what we are trying to achieve and how we are trying to do it. I want to start off by making it very clear that an insurance system, national health insurance, is a health financing system. And it is designed to pool the funds, all the funds that we need as national, uh, the word national shows, to provide access to quality, affordable personal health services. So it's not all the non-personal health services uh, for everyone in South Africa. And what's critical is it will be, we are trying to design a financing system that is based on health needs not on our socioeconomic status, which is how it works at the moment. And why do we, what do we want to do with this? We want to achieve universal health coverage. And there are three elements of universal health coverage that need to be addressed simultaneously. The one is we want to cover more people with a greater range of services and less cost at the point of care. So in fact, in our case, we want to remove the cost at point of care. We don't want co-payments even. And there are reasons for that because of the structure of our society. So we want to make sure that all three of these uh, elements of universal coverage 
are done while we improve the quality of what we are providing. And don't think for a minute that the public sector equals poor quality and the private sector equals good quality. There are examples of good and poor quality in both sectors. And across the board, we need to improve the quality of what we are providing to the public. So if we are, why do we need to have this national health insurance? Well, uh, the point of departure is that healthcare is a human right. We are all entitled to access to healthcare. And that is an international principle that all countries uh, ascribe to. And what we argue is that it's not my fault if I get an illness. Obviously, I can drink myself into a ill health and I can take part in uh, dangerous sports and I can create my own health problems. But my, it's not my financial status that should be determine whether I get health care. It should be that I need the health care is what determines that I get the health care. Uh, the problem with our present system is that it is the biggest dichotomy of basically all countries in the world. There's no other country that is as inequitable in its system. And we know we have a huge, uh, a very high Gini coefficient in our society and it's reflected in our health system. So we have a two tier health system and both have poor outcomes collectively as a country. We have very poor outcomes for the inputs that we put in. And the problem is that we have this public sector that's fragmented. As I said, there are nine different departments delivering health services, plus the national department, plus a whole range of local governments. The services are generally poor. We'll talk about why. They are generally in or largely inefficient. They are understaffed. And the system is, the whole public sector is ill-equipped. And this poor system has to serve 85% of the population. On the other hand, we have an equally fragmented, over-serviced, over-specialized and very expensive private sector that's just getting more expensive by the year. And it serves only about 15% of the population. Now you can argue whether it's 16% and 84, or whether it's 14 and 86. It's around about those figures and some people do use uh, both sectors. So this does not cast in stone, but proportionately, that's what we have. And the problem is with all, so many of the resources sitting in the private sector serving such a small portion of the population, it's not possible to only fix one of the systems. We have to fix the entire system. They're mutually dependent. We train in the same places. Many of the staff work in both sectors, sometimes illegally, but sometimes legally. And so fiddling with only one part of the system or expecting to pour money into the public sector and hoping it will catch up with the private sector is not the solution. We spend 8.5% of our GDP, and it's not a small GDP, it's one of the larger GDPs in the world, and we are not getting the kind of outcomes that we really should be getting for the money we're putting into it. So the bottom line is the whole system needs a facelift. And we need to recognize that in that facelift, some of what we have to do is systemic. The entire system does not work and we need to change it. And a large part of what we need to do is local. Even without the systemic changes, there's a lot of what we can do to improve the environment and care to our patients, both sectors. So how's it gonna work? As I said, the NHI is a financing system. And what it will do is it will pool, first of all, the public resources into one NHI fund, but eventually all the resources into one NHI fund. And then that fund will purchase the services, which the bill refers to as benefits, on behalf of the whole nation, and it will purchase services from both public and private healthcare providers. So the public are led to believe in media reports that we are going to nationalize the health system. We're not going to nationalize the health system. We're going to nationalize the financing system, or a large part of it, and we are going to use both the public and the private providers to provide good quality health care for all of us. And so what the fund will do is it will contract directly with the service providers. That's very different from how the system works at the moment, where uh, in the public sector, the contracting happens or the, our contract as the public 
is through the government, through the provinces, and there's no contracting directly with service providers. And then the public, who are referred to as users of the system in the bill, will then register, either at a clinic or a family practitioner. The bill, in fact, says you can register anywhere. And you will get your services starting in the primary healthcare environment and then referred into the more sophisticated uh, levels of care when required. And this is referred to, if you read in the international media and those of you who are familiar with how these things work, it's a purchaser provider split where the NHI is the purchaser and the providers are many, both public and private. And we refer to what we are doing in South Africa as a single purchaser model. Um, it doesn't mean there will be only one purchaser because services, benefits that are not provided by the fund will be still provided through uh, medical schemes for those who wish to buy those services which are not deemed to make a, an impact on the, on the health of the nation. So the NHI fund will be the strategic purchaser. Now, how, does, how is that different from our current purchasing? Well, the fund will purchase the services for all of us based on need. So if I have a abdominal pain and I'm diagnosed as having appendicitis, uh, the fund will purchase the appendicectomy and the ongoing care that's required to get me back to health. If I break my arm, the same thing. And the fund will procure the medicines, the health goods and the related products that are needed for the purchasing, but will not purchase them. So what do we mean by procure? Procure is where we go out and we use the buying power of the fund to negotiate best prices, and we decide centrally which of those products are uh, required to provide the benefits and which of them are the most suitable or the optimal and within our means to procure. So we will first of all design the benefit and then decide we need suture materials and we need uh, um, knee replacements and this and that and the next thing. And they become part of our essential medicines list and our essential drug, um, equipment list, et cetera. And they call that the formulary. And the, the benefit design determines what we include and exclude in what we are going to procure. And then the fund negotiates those prices. Now, obviously, technology is improving all the time. There are new things happening and we have choices to make. Sometimes the drugs are expensive, sometimes they are not so expensive, and sometimes the intervention is not really helpful, but it's there because medical science has provided it. So we have health technology assessment, uh, a process that we will systematically build up to help us to choose which of these products are gonna give us the best value for money and give us the best outcomes for our, the healthcare of our patients. So the providers will be the ones who are actually purchasing the medicines, the health goods, and the related products because they are going to be paid a fixed price, which we'll talk about in a moment, for what they deliver. But they will purchase knowing that they are getting the lowest possible prices which have been negotiated in the procurement process. I hope that's clear. We can talk about it later. So now what is strategic purchasing? Well, at the moment, we have both system, but two different systems. We have a system in the public sector where providers are paid a fixed budget. And almost inevitably, you see in this kind of uh, system with fixed budgets that there's low productivity, no incentive to see more patients because you're actually over, uh, understaffed and really busy, so you don't really want the patients to come. The facilities become overcrowded, waiting times become long and slow, Turnover is a complete, uh, run, uh, gets run down and down and down. And then the quality deteriorates because everyone is, is just down, downheartened by what is happening. So you never really, in a fixed budget process anywhere, see improvements in the system. It's extremely difficult to inspire people to do that. And you get uh, poor efficiency and poor quality. In the fee-for-service system, which is how our private sector works, there's an incentive for providers to, uh, to decide what they're going to provide and what they're going to charge for. 
And in fact, in our environment, as the health uh, market inquiry showed us, they even decide how, what they're going to be paid for. They decide for themselves. They set their own prices. Um, and what you see then is over-provision of services. Obviously, the market becomes saturated and you have to oversupply to, uh, to make ends meet. And so costs start to escalate because you're, the, it's almost an unlimited option. And the, it's passed on to the, the purchaser through increases in our medical aids tariffs, re reductions in what we are covered for, and increased co-payments. So neither of these systems is particularly efficient. And what the NHI is designed to do, and we are not the only one in the world who has an NHI, is to do strategic purchasing where we match the population need to the benefit. Now, how do you do that? Well, you need huge amounts of data. And what you do is you understand who's the population, what's their demographic profile, what's the burden of disease and what's happening in the epidemiology of that community. And then you monitor it very closely by uh, very clear coding so that we know that we are providing the benefits where the population actually needs it. I'm not going to try and simplify this. It's, it's obviously more complicated than I'm making it out to be. So that brings us to something which will be of interest to you, specifically those of you who are at UJ, around the fourth industrial revolution and its role in, in NHI. In fact, it's our, the role in society, I guess. So I, I think that we, what we need to understand is if you're going to run a system that is serving 60 million people and we are trying to uh, do proactive strategic purchasing and get good prices and use our money effectively, we need competent systems. Those systems need to be able to talk to one. We don't need one system. Well, you, you, you need the backbone of a system that can, where all the bits and pieces and parts of that system can talk to one another. And there we talk about normative standards and interoperability. And we are at a point now where we are very close to publishing for comment the final uh, regulations on normative standards and interoperability. And what that will do is it will mean that anybody who wants to participate in the NHI and be accredited as a provider in the NHI will need to comply so that we can exchange data and we can work together. The second thing is around coding. We have very complicated private sector coding in our country and in the public sector almost nothing gets coded. And yet there are international coding systems for everything from disability to uh, laboratories to outcomes to all kinds of uh, very useful uh, coding systems. And what we need to do now is decide on the coding systems we're going to use, make sure that they work in the Southern African context, at least if not globally, and adopt it, and then systematically migrate from our current uh, lack of coding or poor coding into a new coding system. We have the advantage of big data and the computers to manage that big data. So a lot of what we used to have to do manually can now be done in an automated way. We need to protect that data because we constantly hear about people hacking and uh, we know that we're trying to protect private data and we've got puppy legislation and all kinds of other protections that we need to honor. So we use blockchain to, uh, to um, assist us in the design of the, the way in which we set up the system and manage the data in the system. And then machine learning and artificial intelligence to manage that big data um, is going to become more and more important uh, going forward. Obviously, we're worried about data integrity because you can have all these tools and you've only got half of the data and then the data can't be repeated, so you're never sure whether it's the right data. So it's completeness and its reliability needs to improve. And to do that, we need to make the data collection tools so intuitive and so easy to use that everybody does complete the data and we're able to use it in the system. So for UJ, reading students to operate in the digital world, and I'm not talking only undergraduate students here, I'm talking about students across the board, we are going to need more and more competent people who are competent in using um, all of this IT that we are talking about. This is a massive field in, in the health sector. We can go into some of the, uh, more, the details later. 
So in, in COVID, we've managed to, um, I said earlier, get quite a lot of digital improvements. One, uh, these are just a few of the things that have improved. We've managed to get real-time community health worker household screening, where we're able to watch them moving using um, uh, handheld devices, mostly cell phones, and with a very simple app doing the, the screening of symptoms door to door. And you can watch the community health worker moving on the GIS map uh, in a central command station. And then uh, because the data is all collected automatically, you can see when there are positive symptoms, etc. Hospital readiness, um, in the beginning, we didn't have standard templates. We didn't know where the vacant beds were. We didn't even know where all the ICU beds were. And we certainly were unable to, to match ventilators to ICU beds. Now we have templates and data collection tools where we know not only where the beds are, but which beds are vacant, um, how far they are from the referring uh, hospital or a referring clinic and so forth. I spoke about stock availability for both medicines and PPE. There were systems in place and they, are, they have been robust during this period and have been improved upon. The surveillance dashboards have improved dramatically. Both GIS to show us the mapping and some of that you see in the public domain, but there's a lot of detail that sits behind that, both with the trend analysis and the management of what we call the line lists out of the laboratories. I spoke about oxygen supply. We have that all now electronically monitored as well. And there are apps and apps and more apps for all kinds of things which you'll be aware of in the public domain, uh, some of which are very easy to use and have helped us to um, manage um, uh, um, isolation of patients and so forth. Now, obviously, the big issue with this data is that if we design it properly and if we put the right controls and flags in place, so that if a patient tries to access a benefit that they're not entitled to in order to defraud the system, like a male trying to get a cesarean section, for instance, there must be automatic flags in the system that says, no, this is not, this transaction is not acceptable. If a practitioner repeatedly does something that is outside of the clinical guidelines, the second or the third time we must be warned and, the, and then we must be, uh, get a flag that says, we're not gonna pay for this, uh, this benefit because this practitioner is doing something that is not acceptable. So the, all the safeguards for fraud and corruption they're not only about payment, they're about managing the resources and about managing the integrity of the data itself. So we need risk management. We need, first of all, to identify where the risks are, design those risks out, minimize them as far as possible and deal with privacy at the same time. So all of these require people who understand how these systems work and how to make sure that they are user-friendly for the health worker at the call. I was, um, I know that UJ um, uh, trains a lot of health professionals um, and I was asked what about the role of these health professionals in national health insurance. Well, the national health insurance is because of the way in which the funding works will force very specific changes on the way the services are delivered. I've already mentioned that by directly purchasing from hospitals, for instance, the national health insurance will change the management of hospitals. And because we'll be paying for benefits and not allocating budgets, the onus is on the managers in those facilities to improve the use of their resources. And that's the human resources as well as everything else that they use to deliver the benefits. So the, 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 you use the funding in the funding system to force better discipline and better use of resources. And one of the ways to do that is getting out of the silos that we use at the moment. So in our current system, our nurses are either generalists or specialists, our doctors are generalists or specialists, and they do very little talking to one another. They operate just in their own patch, and there's a competition for which patients who's going to see because the market is saturated and we're all trying to access patients because that's how we make our living. Well, when you are purchasing in a strategic purchasing role, you're not interested in that. What you want is a multi multidisciplinary team, 
where everybody that is required to look after the particular condition of the patient is part of that patient care, and then you pay a global fee. And in fact, we did this during COVID. We paid one global fee for a, a critical care bed or a general bed or a rehabilitation or what we call um, rehabilitation. It was more uh, um, uh, pa patients who were uh, on their deathbed. So we had global fees that we paid to multidisciplinary teams during the COVID. And this is the direction that we want to move in. Obviously, there's a role for public health practitioners and environmental health practitioners in, uh, in looking after the preventive measures and the, uh, helping us to understand what is going on in the, in the epidemiology of the community. But then for those who are hands-on, and I know UJ trains in optometry, podiatry, and radiography, and there are many other what we call allied health professions. Um, and of course, the traditional and complementary medicine practitioners also need to be involved in this multidisciplinary team. We know that in South Africa, more patients see their traditional uh, healers for mental health conditions than they see the, the uh, Western um, mental health practitioners. So we are going to be working towards building these multidisciplinary teams and it won't happen overnight but uh, the, the way to do it is to, to give global payments. So what does the NHI bill say and what does the amendment to the National Health Act say? Well, what it says in big terms about the delivery of services is that the functions that are currently provided in the public sector by the provinces will be nationalized and then delegated back to them but paid for from the fund. That's what the bill says. And in order to coordinate the delivery of services in a different way, closer to the public, the National Health Amendment Bill, uh, or the, the amendment to the National Health Act, uh, provides for a district health management office and for contracting units for primary health care. And the intention of the contracting units for primary health care is to have smaller groups of public and private providers who are looking after designated populations. This will all affect regulators, professional councils, it will affect everybody. And that's why we need to take it incrementally, slowly and carefully, and make sure that we build the alliances, the, the interaction between the digital systems that are required to, to effect these changes. And we don't break things as we go, but that we build to a, a better future. What's the impact going to be on the universities? Well, if we all have to think differently and behave differently, it's a large amount of that responsibility will be passed on to universities to make sure that new graduates understand the structure of the new environment and their role in that new environment. There's more than a place for everybody. In fact, we know we're going to be short of uh, personnel. And so we're going to need to think very differently about how we provide our uh, or deliver our part of the services. So what's happened so far? Well, COVID-19 has obviously delayed the parliamentary process and that's the starting point. But the bill was published, there were written comments received. That process closed on the 29th of, October, of November last year. The portfolio committee did embark on public hearings and they completed them just prior to, to COVID. Oral submissions, requests by um, Various members and organizations in public were made for, to make oral submissions, but COVID intervened and those have not commenced yet. And I'm not quite sure how they're gonna manage that using uh, virtual um, various, you know, like we are doing now on these conferences. And then of course, the National Council of Provinces must still compense, uh, commence with hearings because this is a massive reform piece of legislation that affects the provinces uh, quite directly. And so it's a, what we call a section 76 bill, which requires consultation at uh, NCOP and provincial level. Yet uh, again, not just the, what the portfolio committee did. In the meantime, we have started on the process of, of establishing the administrative capacity to, to uh, build the fund. Um, there are lots of functions, including management of benefits and all the other things I've been speaking about. And an interim organogram was drafted and was approved by the minister late last year. 
and uh, Treasury did allocate some money for this year to uh, appoint the first few key positions in the office. But unfortunately, COVID caught us just at the time when that was about to go through the process. So it's sitting somewhere between health and the Department of Public Service and Administration. In the meantime, as I mentioned, that a lot of the digital capability that is required to manage the NHI was embarked on some time back. You may have heard in the media about the um, HPRS, which is the patient registration system. Well, there are 46 million people on the system already. Um, nearly all the public sector clinics already have their technology installed, the hardware and the software installed. And there are other various bits and pieces of the system, as I mentioned, which was strengthened during COVID, which we will use going forward. And then there's a, in the presidencies, there's the NHI War Room work streams, which have been um, assisting with unblocking blockages where there are interdepartmental issues. And um, those committees of, or, or work streams have all been revived and have started meeting again in the last month. So in conclusion, and I, as I said, I'd rather take questions than go on and on, maybe not addressing what's on your mind, is that we're under no illusion. NHI is not a panacea. It is a different financing mechanism which will require a totally different way of providing and delivering the health services. It is a purchaser-provider split, and it is not a nationalization of the provision of health services. And the point of departure is that over time, we are striving for greater equity and social solidarity, where we get the care we need because we need it, not because we can pay. And the mechanisms for managing the health benefits and the technologies and the goods and services are aimed, as we said, all of them are aimed at covering more people, levering the advantage of the scale of having uh, the resources to care for 60 million people, covering a greater range of services than we are able to at the moment and reducing the cost at point of care. And in fact, as I said, removing it. And of course, we must improve the quality of care as we go along. We're not just trying to do a slash, slap dash service. So the purpose of NHI is to achieve universal health coverage using a different financing mechanism that uh, changes the way we see service delivery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Crisp. I think it was wonderful. A fantastic summary of NHI and, and its current status, where it is we're going to, and um, its continued progress. So we're going to open up now for a question and answer session. Um, we have already received a question uh, into the, the written panel. Um, attendees are welcome to raise their hands. There should be a raise hand function available to you. Just raise your hand if you'd like to ask your question over your microphone and we'll call upon you uh, in a particular order to ask those. Uh, but we can perhaps move to the first question, Dr. Crisp. You should be able to see it your side. Um, and I'll just indicate for it to be answered live because you can just give your... Okay. Sure thing. Okay, um, well obviously that's a good question. Um, must I, if I read the question, can others see it? It says, I mentioned about males not being able to get a caesarean section. How would this affect a trans, a trans, transgender people who have a male ID number but have a uterus? Access to healthcare has already been a fight for marginalized communities. Creating this system has the potential to put healthcare access for marginal communities back by decades. Well, it, it, it has the potential if we don't manage it right, but it also has the potential to put us forward. Uh, and, and to dramatically improve the lot of people who have been marginalized. And this is one group of people who have been marginalized. And the one way to do that is that in the health system, we don't classify people as male and female only. There are a whole range of classifications because we recognize that uh, the health conditions of people uh, are, are not just in a binary form. So when I mention that as an example, if somebody classifies themselves and regards themselves as male without a uterus and gets a cesarean and then tries to claim for a cesarean section, it would be flagged. If somebody was not 
uh, had not declared that kind of information and it were investigated. And it was shown that this is a gender, transgender person with a particular problem that uh, is not as a, a binary uh, solution. Then, of course, th that offers us an opportunity to refer that patient to more complex healthcare and to say, that's fine, you can be paid for that because that fits into the appropriate care for this person. So th the point is that out of the 72% of all deliveries in the private sector that are delivered by cesarean section, I would be very surprised if there are more than one or two that are transgender issues. The question is why are they doing all those cesarean sections when the global target is 15%? And we would now start to clamp down to say this is an abuse, it's not good for the babies, it's not good for the mothers, they're getting unnecessary anesthetics and so forth. So maybe I picked a bad example to, to use, but maybe it turned out to be a good example because it shows how by recognizing and flagging something that's not part of the everyday norm, if you like, we can offer a better service to, to a patient. Thank you. Good, thank you. The next question comes from Tsubohu Rikotsu. Uh, Tsubohu, you are live. You're welcome to ask your question. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself as well. Tsubohu, are you with us? Don't seem to be getting a, a question coming through from Tuboho. Uh, Tuboho, just let us know if you'd if you'd like to. They will move to the next question. It's from Vanna. Vanna. It seems they're not able to unmute themselves. Yeah, I think they're unable to unmute themselves and I don't think we're able to do it for them either. Yeah. Perhaps we can get the question typed. I think it might be easier. Well, if you are able to, then just type your question for us. We'll be able to have a look at that. Are there any other questions from any other participants? You're welcome to write them in the Q&A field. Nicholas, if I might ask a question from my side, I think part of the, the articles that are perhaps doing the rounds at the moment are um, how it is that what's taken place within COVID-19 may have undermined trust in NHI going forward. Um, how do you, in your opinion, how is it that that could be changed? I think there's, there's a certain amount of response from the government which was certainly supported in, its, in how it came to deal with COVID-19, but also the, the trust eradication from elements such as corruption, for example. How, how do you overcome that uh, proceeding to something which is ultimately South Africa's version of universal health coverage? Yeah, uh, no, that's a, I mean, it's a nice question and it's a long discussion, um, but let, let's just try and tackle it like this. Um, as you can see, I'm now a grey-haired old bloke. I've been in the system a long time. I started work in 1984 as a medical officer in an old mission hospital. 
And uh, when you've come a long route and you've been in the system a very long time and you've worked all over the place, it's devastating when corruption destroys all the effort that you're putting in. But you have to remain focused on what we're trying to achieve. Um, if we just give up and we say we don't think there's any chance of ever overcoming corruption, we don't think we can design systems that, can, that make it really difficult to, to defraud the system and so on, then we shouldn't be doing our job. We, we just cannot sit in an environment and believe that it's acceptable, that it just carries on like this. And although we, um, we still see this in the media every day and our hearts are sore from it, uh, I try very hard to look at where there is action. And I do believe that people who have been guilty of corruption and have been before the Zondo Commission and have done other things are going to get what comes to them. Uh, I have to believe that because otherwise there's no purpose in me continuing working. And I'm a South African citizen and I'm a South African through and through, strong patriot, I expect to live another 30 years. Then how can I just stand by and let it happen? So that's the attitude we have to have. We are going to fight us as citizens and we're going to do everything we can to deal with corruption. As far as the health system is concerned, we cannot, cannot sit by while the vast majority of people in this country just do not get good health care. They don't get any health care in many places. We've seen pictures during COVID that just make your heart bleed. People who are getting nothing. They are they left in some rural area because it's so hard to get there that they're, they're the forgotten people. For us as health professionals, that is not acceptable. So for me, I see health as a service, not as an industry. Yes, I make a living out of what I do, but if my sole goal is to see how much money I can make and I have to over-service patients or do things to patients in order to be able to charge them or add a code on a medical aid or double claim or do whatever, what's wrong with me? That's fraud and corruption like anybody else just on a slightly smaller scale. So we need to clean up our act as citizens, all of us. We need to, if you want to see this country prosper, we need to get in the bull ring and deal with the problems. And it doesn't matter who we are, whether you're a junior medical student just starting out, whether you are just entering health sciences faculty, or whether you're on your way out like I am towards the end of our career. We all have different insights, we all have different experience, and we need to get in there and clean up the mess. Good, thanks. And I think that, that segues on to the, the next question, which also comes from Angela von Hoffen, which says, uh, can you give your opinion on how the system is not going to be open to the same abuse that is so endemic to government by giving the government so much procurement power? And I think that sort of redirects on the basis of your previous answer as to the types of systems when it comes to things like procurement um, and uh, relationships and contracts with individual healthcare providers and institutions as well. Um, yeah. What kinds of systems would be in place to try to safeguard against that? Yeah. Okay, so, I mean, obviously this is, the, if anything keeps me awake at night, this, this is what keeps me awake at night. And um, I, I, as you heard in the introduction, I've worked in many countries and uh, you, you see things over the years that, tell you how to solve a problem or how to avoid a problem. But there's always somebody one step ahead of you. So you need to be extremely vigilant. And the starting point is on risk identification. And we have lots of people who specialize in this. They are risk management professionals. In fact, this week, I will be to next week, I'll be talking to IMSA, the, the South, South African, uh, the Institute of Risk Managers of South Africa, and they are health risk managers as well who are, spend their life looking at ways to prevent fraud and corruption. We need every bit of help we can get in designing systems that make it difficult to defraud the system. And then when somebody does succeed, we need the flag, we need to be able to deal with them. And so we already have a system in place where the president has appointed a, it's a forum, it's called the Health Anti-Corruption Forum, where all the law enforcement agencies are involved. And so they deal with, if you like, our failures, our system failures, when somebody has successfully defrauded the system or corrupted the system. 
But we also have a, a forum which I co-chair with Andy Matibi, who is the head of the SIU, Special Investigating Unit, where we are looking at uh, the details of the framework to prevent fraud. We won't put anything in place that has not been well thought through. Um, and a lot of it is in the digital systems, but some of it is in the manual systems. So how does the money flow? How do you prevent too much money being in one place? How do you make it so transparent that um, the public can see every single transaction? So those are the kinds of things that I'm looking at. We want every hospital's transactions to be visible to the public. Their scoring on quality to be visible to the public. The, the, um, what they are purchasing, who is tendering at what prices, who, which professional has got what registration. Right now, you can go as a member of the public onto the HPCA website. You can look up any practitioner, not just doctors, everyone who's registered with HPCSA, and you can see if they're still registered and what they're registered for. This needs to be absolutely transparent that people find it hard to hide. So I'm not saying that it's not possible to defraud or corrupt the system. I'm saying it's the, the job is to make sure that it's really difficult to do and there are consequences when you do it. Thank you. Uh, the, the next question also, is, it's maybe a follow-up from Angela, is just to say, are the ambitions of NHR not too lofty? Why not get the fundamentals of primary health right? And then build... Okay. This is in yeah. So Angela, you're absolutely right. That is in fact the route that we're going. You have to, you know, there's a, there's a good, those of you who follow uh, business principles and business leaders and so on, you'll read about begin with the end in mind, uh, Stephen Covey. So that is what you are seeing in the public domain. We are thinking ahead and saying, how might this thing look in 10, 15, 20 years time? What do we want our health system to look like? And sometimes it's hard to read the future because technology and the environment changes. You don't plan for a COVID, you know it's coming, but you don't know if it'll be a respiratory or what it'll be. But you still try and understand what you want the system to do and what you want it to look like. Then you put the building blocks in place. And you are quite right. Building block number one is get the primary health care system foundation sorted out. But how do you put contracting units for primary health care in place? with integrated multidisciplinary teams if you don't have a whole lot of these other digital solutions available? How do you pay for them? How do we get risk-adjusted capitation models and value-added bonuses or incentives in place if we don't collect the data that we understand what's going on in the communities? The answer is we can't. And also, primary health care, if it doesn't have an ability to refer the patients up the line, starts to panic and you start to, do, to undermine your own ability to deliver services. So right from the community health workers doing door-to-door -door surveys, using mHealth digital tools, collecting data, identifying the elderly, the disabled, people with diabetes, hypertension, you name it, in their communities, and assisting those people to have a more productive life in their communities, right from there, through, uh, curative care, preventive immunization, in, uh, you know, giving people the correct information on food and nutrition and so on. That is building step number one. But we can't continue to do it in a way where everybody works in a silo. One GP in his rooms all by himself, just being a post office, sending people for, to a dermatologist, to a pediatrician, to a this, to a that, does not look after the whole patient's care. We need to rethink that model and we need to pay people differently so that they think differently and that quality and outcomes can be measured so that we as the public know, hey, the, this team in this community is doing a great job and that the government is, through the NHI, shifting funds to where people really need it. So it is an incremental approach. Um, I do worry a little bit about some of the aspirations on timelines, but there's a lot that we can do. And I think that was just going to be my follow on to that. In terms of timelines, there was an original 13-year uh, layout in terms of the plan. Does the impact of COVID or anything that's led up to this point mean that there might be a reconsideration of timelines going forward? 
No, not really. I mean, the, the, so the first phase is to get the foundation in place. And we estimate that will take about four years. Um, obviously, if the budgets get chopped more, it may slow it down a little bit. Uh, but sometimes some of the things that have been done in the pilots didn't really do what we wanted them to do. And we need to do them differently. So, so we may have money that we had put into some of the more experimental um, changes to service delivery that we will have to remove. But on the whole, to rebuild the entire health system is going to take 20 years. It just does that. You know, other countries we've been to, I've had the privilege of traveling around quite a lot in the world. I know it takes time, but getting the essence of your system in place need not take 20 years. Okay, so on to the next question, really talking about um, the ability of the healthcare user to be able to make choice and whether or not uh, patients that make use of homeopaths, chiropractors, traditional healers or phytotherapists in the traditional and complementary medicine realm would have the freedom of choice in order to choose those particular practitioners and whether or not perhaps as an add-on to that, whether those practitioners would be able to sign up to be an NHI provider. Okay, so the starting point for that is benefits. All health systems who go this route on universal health coverage, whether it's an NHS, an NHI, or whatever other similar form, what they do is, is designed around the benefits. So no country can afford everything. If the United States spends 18% of its GDP on healthcare and still has between 30 and 40 million people who don't have access to healthcare. You can pour money in a hole. You can transplant faces. You can do all kinds of things in today's world. Does it contribute to the health of the nation? Can you afford it? So our argument is we can afford to deal with all the major health challenges in our country, but there may be fringe things we can't afford to do. So what the, the, the essence of the debate is really around what do we include in the benefits and whether those benefits will include the complementary professions. And that's the argument. That's where I don't know the answer yet. You will have to participate in the discussions. So if you want to say, does a homeopathic uh, consultation and a chiropractor consultation is it going to be covered as a benefit in the NHI and is it part of the, um, the clinical guideline? At the moment, it's not. If you want it to be, you've got to argue why it should be and how to get it there and why it, in terms of HTA, has a place to be there. That's exactly what the traditional healers are doing at the moment. They're arguing that their consultation, not only around um, mental health, but around a lot of other things that they do, should be in the package of NHI. Once it's in the benefit, we as the people working in the fund need to get the actuaries together and the economists together and say, if there are X number of consultations based on the epidemiology and the burden of disease that we are measuring, what will the cost be of paying for that benefit with this particular technology? And that's the quid pro quo that's changing all the time. But if you want to choose between, is there going to be, are we going to include heart transplants or are we not going to include heart transplants? Then we'll have to say, well, what's the criteria for a heart transplant? Because if the criteria is low and we're going to need to do 100 a year, we're going to run out of money very fast. So those are the, the, the arguments for and against and the, the, the rationing of services that happen in this in this discussion. Your medical aides are doing it to you all the time, you might just not be aware of it. Uh, all around the world, that's what happens. So for instance, dialysis. In the public sector, the dialysis criteria from one province to the other is different. It shouldn't be. It should be the same for everyone. You can be 95 years old with five comorbidities and be on dialysis in the private sector. That'll never happen in the public sector because we just can't afford it. You're lucky. I, at my age, I do not qualify for dialysis in the public service today. So if I go into renal failure, there's no chance I will get dialyzed in the public sector. So that, those are the kinds of criteria. So whether you include one service or don't include another one is a weighing up of pros and cons. And when you hear the actuaries and the 
economists and the, the smart people in the media telling you that we can't afford the NHI, if you take everything that you currently can get on the top uh, comprehensive program in the private sector and you multiply it by 60 million people, even the United States can't afford that. So clearly we, that is not the route we're going. But for everything that is not a benefit, there will be, that's what section 33 of the bill says, an option to insure yourself or to pay out of pocket and still get that care, but it just will not be paid for by the fund. And I think there's that, that sort of upscaling that goes, which answers the previous question, where you're starting with baby steps from primary health care and working your way up, is that your, ultimately your platform is based on primary health care. Uh, yeah services that can deliver on that essentially have to be included in, as you've said, in the, in the protocols and the guidelines. Um, yeah. I think that the next question from Carol really deals with that as well. I think you may have covered it in terms of yeah. once those services, whether they're complementary or allied health are included, how is it that they would work? There, there would ultimately be some means of mechanism um, by which they they either see it as their first choice of care, or is it envisaged that somebody actually has to be referred for that kind of care? Um, and that, I think that talks to more of a system that may come up under the national health system in the UK, where it is that they maybe had these allied health professionals that had, you had to get through a medical doctor first in order to be referred on to them. Uh, is there anything within NHR that you know of so far that talks to either of those models that Hypothetically, if you have an allied health service that's included, is it a direct point of care or do they have to go through a gatekeeper to get there? Okay, so the, primary, the NHI bill at the moment says that uh, uh, any primary health care practice, any primary health care service is the gatekeeper, that point of care. So whether that is a public clinic or a GP, uh, at the moment that would be the, um, the gatekeeper to prevent people from getting into specialist care into hospital unnecessarily. But we are also trying to build a primary health care system as I spoke about just now with community health workers and understanding the role of the community health worker and how we use them effectively. So we should be having that same discussion about all the complementary health practitioners, everyone. You know, there are people who have Ayurvedic medicine, there are people who do their own, you know, they. Uh, Reiki specialists and people who do reflexology and all kinds of stuff. So whether that gets included or doesn't get included in a cup, the contracting unit for primary health care, and how they choose to, uh, to deliver their service and structure their services. I was reading yesterday about um, uh, the, the Inuit people in Alaska and how they have a very different package of health care uh, in Alaska from what they would have in the rest of America. And in uh, New Zealand, they have uh, uh, Maori and Islander services that are included in their service, but are different from the mainstream services. So conceivably, we can go that way. We, we need to apply our minds, we need to have the debate, we need to do the costs and work it out. But until we do that, the service will be structured where there is a gatekeeper. The main purpose of the gatekeeper is to get to keep people out of hospital. But there's a sense of there's a flexibility in the system that there, there's a structure with, that would provide for those services and if you get pitched as being a primary health care provider whoever that is ultimately is part of the service and could direct it on. Um, the, the next question is a, a combination of uh, a statement and a question it's just to say that those who criticize in HR argue that government wants to disrupt private health care that is functioning efficiently and that government should leave the private health care alone as it helps uh, the government in reducing the burden of health care, i.e. during COVID, the private sector played a critical role. And there's just the question of what your opinion on this is, and that's from David. Okay, thanks, David. It's, it's much more complicated than that. In fact, the private sector undermines the public sector. It's not, uh, doesn't uh, improve the quality of the, it doesn't make it easier for the government to look after other people. And it's very simple to see why. 67% of all specialists in this country and all specialist care is in the private sector and looks after 15% of the population. So by, by uh, creating the magnet in the private sector, it's totally impossible to get the specialists to stay in the public sector and look after the majority of people 
who need those conditions. And the HMI report, the Health Market Inquiry report, showed that in order to, to make a living in the private sector, you, the tendency is, and also because there's a lot of litigation um, threat in the private sector, not covered by the government, uh, practitioners tend to over-service a lot. I mean, I've spoken to about uh, caesarean sections because it's the most disgusting figure in the whole world by a long way, more than double any other country in the world. But tonsillectomy is the same thing. So what makes it a child um, more susceptible to tonsillitis or require tonsillectomies more because you've got money? It doesn't make sense. It's got nothing to do with the child and the child's health. It's got to do with some other factors that are just not related to our healthcare. And there are many examples of this and they, were, they are highlighted and the graphs are in the HMI report. So it's not just me saying these things. So the private sector definitely has a role to play. They do not publish quality. Yesterday, no, not yesterday, day before yesterday, we are we? Tuesday, Monday, yesterday. There was an advisory put out from the Health the Competition Commission on a follow up to the Health Market Inquiry. Uh, now demanding that the private sector do account for their outcomes because they don't. You try and get a record of a, an anesthetic provided in a private hospital. You can't get it from the hospital because it's not a hospital record. You have to go to the private rooms and you've got to ask for it and, you, and they won't make it available. Why? In the public sector, you can, you can get copies of the, all those records. Your, lawyer, your lawyers, you yourself as a patient, provided they haven't been stolen by the lawyers, of course, which is a new trend at the moment. They, they take the files and then they use it in cases against, there's another whole market in, uh, in litigation. But the point is that it's not either or. The private sector delivery providers are needed. Most of them offer really good health care. They do a good job. They're the same qualifications as the rest of us. That's not the argument. The argument is how do we use the resources more effectively? How do we protect you and me, because I'm still on a hospital plan, from paying 11% more next year from what I paid this year and getting less coverage and having to pay more in? How do we stop that? And the way to do it is to pool our resources. Why do we tolerate a medical scheme that covers only 3,000 people? Where's the risk pool in that? It's not possible. And why do we allow, allow anti-selection in medical schemes? So those things have to stop. And the way for us to make sure that everybody, and that's one thing we should have learned in COVID, if the person next to me, even a homeless person, gets COVID, I'm at risk. And I need to get that into my head about everything. Somebody gets into a car drunk. Somebody gets into a car when, and has an epileptic fit. Somebody walks across the street. We are all uh, responsible for our own health care, but we are also a risk to the people around us if we don't look after everybody. That is something we need to understand as citizens, global citizens. The next question comes from Angela. So just in terms of cost, can you just refresh on how it will be funded? So the funding mechanism of NHR. Um, yeah. Be different from public okay. and current, how it's currently funded and where the money would sure. go. Okay. So just the big, the high level numbers at the moment, I'll try and make it a little, uh, see if I can do it clearly. We spend about 256 million rand, billion rand a year uh, as of taxpayers' money out of the fiscus on healthcare. That money is allocated as part of the provincial equitable share to provinces. And then it's carved out of the provinces, more or less 30% of everything allocated to each province. The, the lowest one is 28%, the highest is 34%, is allocated to healthcare and is spent on uh, delivering primary and secondary and tertiary healthcare. And that adds up to 500, uh, around about uh, 256 billion rand. It includes capit the capital and what we call conditional grants. And there's, there's some other complicated structures around how the public purse is spent and allocated. Then there's a sum of around about 175 billion, which is private money used in purchasing 
medical scheme cover from 76 medical schemes with more than 260 different packages. And I defy you to understand what's in your own package, never mind the other 259. I don't understand what's in mine. I only understand when they tell me we're not covering this and we're not covering this, we're not covering this. So we then pay that money voluntarily into our medical schemes and they pay for our health care. And because it's complicated, they have, uh, they cover their own costs. So there's 76 boards to pay for and all the management. And then they pay the administrators to administer these things for them. And that costs 12% of everything that you pay to your medical aid gets taken in overheads for, for administration fees. Um, and then all of us, including people uh, who are covered only, who only have healthcare in the public sector, plus those of us in the private sector, buy out of pocket. So for instance, because I'm on a hospital package and I go to a, a I need to see a GP or a dentist or have my eyes tested, I pay out of pocket for that care. Same with the guy who goes to the pharmacy to go and buy himself some panada or whatever he needs for his headache. That, that out of pocket spending, we don't know the full size of it, but we know that it's at least 60 billion. So if you add up all of that money, it's well over 500 billion rand that we spend. And people will fudge the edges around the bits we don't understand. That does not include what we can't measure in complementary healthcare, and it does not include the money that people spend on traditional health practitioners. So we spend a lot of money on healthcare. Our argument is that that same volume of money should all be in the NHI. Well, the vast bulk of it. The only money that should not go into the NHI is that that pays for the malaria control program, the environmental programs that check up on restaurants, the, the, the rabies control programs, and so forth. So there are, there are a range of public health programs that should be funded directly from the budget by the health departments. And all the rest of the money should ideally go into a fund that covers all of us. However, we respect the fact that there are services that, are, that will not be in the NHI benefits and that people will uh, want to insure themselves for outside of that. And that's fine. So a small proportion of that total cost is likely to remain in private insurance of sorts and the rest of it should come into the fund. Now, how you get it in there is the trick. So very briefly, the public money, you have to change the functions of government because funds follows functions, and that will be a fight. Because if you're a, a politician in a province and we tell you we're gonna remove one third of your budget, Mr. Premier, he says, no ways, why? No, we want to run a better health service in your province. No, 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 I control this money. So no, we're gonna corrupt it somewhere else, not here. Ha, 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 ha. So the moving of money and taking away power from people who are in uh, political positions doesn't happen easily. So that's the first part of money that needs to be moved. And you don't do it in one fell swoop, you do it in bits and pieces, you do it over a number of financial years, and it's, uh, it's a big issue. Likewise, with the private sector money, you don't suddenly switch off the medical aids and say from tomorrow, all the medical aid money must now go as no longer voluntary but compulsory contributions into the NHI fund. There's no ways it could do that. It's, it, it's just would not be feasible to administer it. So what you do is systematically we have started to remove the rebates on private insurance, private, private medical aids. Why you would get a rebate when you are on, on uh, um, getting a medical aid is something that doesn't make sense to me and the economists have tried to explain it to me I still don't I don't accept the explanations so that's the first thing that happens you remove the rebates and you ship that money into the NHI fund then you start to designate benefits and you say this package of primary health care benefits is going to be covered in the fund from next year or year after next therefore from that year medical schemes will no longer be able to cover it and we changed the, taxing the tax structure so that instead of paying a voluntary medical aid, you now pay a compulsory contribution to the NHI fund. It will always be less than you pay uh, currently as a voluntary contribution. And remember, your providers are still going to be both public and private providers. 
So you will still have your choice. You will still have your services. Good. So the, the next question uh, surrounds how does that NHI and NGO grant-based healthcare could actually work um, and how does that be supported through NHI, specifically thinking about HIV testing and treatment, which is massively internationally funded. Okay, this is very topical because I had a discussion about this earlier this morning. Uh, the sovereignty of nations is something to be protected. So I worked in Nigeria for 16 years, and one of the things I worked on was building the HIV program. And one of the things the Nigerians fought hard to do is to control their own HIV program. So although the donors make major contributions and are a, a source of technical expertise, the program needs to be controlled by the sovereign nation. And that's the route that we have always adopted in this country and will continue to adopt. The question is, can we sustain vertical programs? Are they cost effective? Does it make sense to call the same person for their HIV medication today, for their hypertension tomorrow, and their diabetes the next day, because we've got vertical programs running? And there are examples of this where it does work like that. And then the mother must come back again the next day because the child must come for antenatal care. I mean, that's not how you look after a patient. So we want multidisciplinary teams with no vertical programs, you can have vertical funding so that we can account for what we're doing, but not vertical delivery of services. And how we slowly but surely shift the integration of care in the contracting units for primary health care is going to take time. Um, so yes, of course, we're very grateful for the support that we get, both the technical support and the actual funding, but uh, we need to take control and integrate these programs. Good, we're gonna take one last question for today's session. We're running just about on time. And the question is, what is the response of government to migrants living in South Africa who are still struggling to access public service? And that's from Tabor, who was trying to ask a question earlier. Yeah. Okay, so Tabor, I'm glad you managed to get your question. And it's an important question. So we have a constitution in this country that starts off in the preamble by saying that this constitution, the country, and everything that we do in this country is for all the people who live in it. It does not say for citizens. It says it is for everybody who lives in it. So from a constitutional departure point, the country will look after everybody who's in the country. But that some people are legally in the country and some are illegally in the country. So what the National Health Bill says is that everybody who is legally in the country, living in this country, will get the benefits of the NHI because they are contributing to the taxes. And whether that taxes is through employment or whether it's through VAT or whether it's through buying things that have import duties and using a taxi that's paying a petrol duty or whatever, we all pay tax. So the benefits for people who are legally in the country will be the same. Then we have visitors to the country who are legally here, but they're popping in and out. And we don't want them popping in and out to abuse our health system and take away resources that are intended for the population. So the bill says they will insure themselves. So if you come on holiday from the UK or from Australia or whatever to visit South Africa, you will take insurance and your insurance will be billed by the National Health Insurance and we're not expecting to pay for you. Then there's the third category, and those are people who are not legally here. They have no purpose in being here, and they, they haven't uh, followed the correct procedures. Now that might be a fight with home affairs about whether they are or aren't legal and so on. But once somebody is not legally in the country, the bill says that uh, we will still care for them. We will provide all emergency care and we will certainly look after the children and pregnant women who are a major, uh, major risk if we don't look after them. But you can't expect the taxpayer to pay for uh, hip replacements and major care of people who are not legally in the country. Because the, there are other laws that say that people who are illegally in the country must be repatriated to their own countries. So I'm not going to get into what I believe is right and wrong. I'm just telling you what is in the law and what is in the bill at the moment. And I'm pretty sure these things will be contested and debated in Parliament in the months ahead. Thanks. Good, thank you very much. And uh, 
thank you, Dr. Chris, for your time today. And thank you to all the attendees that have joined us today as well. Uh, I think it's been hugely beneficial in a, a public platform like this that is able to engage with people not only locally, but across the country and, and internationally is incredibly important um, and allows for debate and questions to be posed as well. I'll just hand over to Dr. Razlock um, to the end of the session, but thank you everyone for joining us today from my side. Dr. Razlock? Uh, Dr. Aslock, I think you're just on mute. Thank you. I, I was hoping for lip reading there, eh? So thank you for a really um, comprehensive, well-explained presentation. I think you did a fantastic job. We all learned so much. I know I really did myself. Um, and for a really convincing argument, uh, um, very well presented. So um, thank you everyone for your time. Thank you for being here. And Dr. Chris, we hope to have you back in the, on a similar type of um, platform again to, to expand these discussions and take them further. Thank you. Yeah, it would be my pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks. Okay.